OK. All right. So for those of you who are here, uh, happy Halloween. We only have one real announcement, which is there's a mid-semester survey up. Uh, please do take a look at it and fill it out. Let us know what you're thinking. Um, the link is on Piazza. So this one, we didn't blast your email. We just stuck it in Piazza. The um, homework four will be up soon, probably by the weekend. If you're really eager, you can just kind of maniacally click refresh. It might be up earlier. But the weekend's the goal. Project four. Oh, we'll talk a lot about project four today. OK, so um, today is going to be Halloween themed in many ways. So in particular, uh, Pac-Man and the ghosts are making an appearance. And as a special Halloween thing, the ghosts will be invisible today. So what we're, we're going to talk about today is hidden Markov models and particle filtering, which are, um, among other things, techniques for modeling what happens when the world changes over time and you only observe part of it. So let me start with a demo. And in fact, this demo is your project four. So let's say you were Pac-Man, and these were kind of real spooky Halloween caliber ghosts, which means they're invisible. Now, uh, this Pac-Man can eat ghosts, but first he has to find them. So where are they? Well, as soon as I start moving, uh, they'll stay invisible, but you'll see in the bottom colored numbers, which are kind of noisy readings of how far the ghosts are. So now let's say I want to eat the kind of orange ghost. Well, let's see if I can find him. I could kind of try to move to minimize that. I might even accidentally eat him if I do this long enough. Um, it's really, really hard. This isn't fun. Uh, no one's going no to be publishing this game anytime soon. Um, if I do this long enough, sooner or later, oh, I accidentally ate the other ghost. OK, so sooner or later, you know, they're, they're not very bright. Sooner or later, you get one. Um, but this would be so much better if you could somehow take these numbers over time and combine them with your model of how the world works, meaning where the walls are, the maze, also your model of how the ghosts move, and figure out where they are. So um, by the end of this class, we'll have the techniques to do that, and that's going to be the bulk of your project for. OK, look, one of them just ate itself. Well, lovely. All right, uh, it'll be better by the end of class once we have a little more math. So um, reasoning over time and space. So often you want to reason about a sequence for some reason. And the most common case is the sequence is somehow the same kind of thing replicated over time. So for example, in robot localization, right, figuring out where a robot is on a known map, which is basically what Pac-Man's doing to the ghosts in that demo, you want to know where the robot is. And maybe at every time slice, you get a reading from maybe a rangefinder or sonar or images or something like that that gives you a noisy indication of where you might be. Well, actually, once we have some more of the math, we'll see this uh, in action at the, end of, um, at the end of lecture. But there could be more than this. So for example, you might be trying to decide when to, uh, when to have a pop-up show up. And maybe you want to alert the user to you know, do a backup or something. But you don't want to do it while you're giving, uh, while you're giving a lecture. Right, for example. <laughs> so, um, you guys, this is uh, one year. So everybody, uh, hi. Uh, people would be with you if they had any idea what you just said. Um, <laughs> All right. One year, people kind of ran through in Pac-Man and Ghost costumes in a foghorn. Um, so there's a chance we won't actually make it through this lecture today. OK. So reasoning over time. You might be modeling the user over time and figuring out when is a good time to interrupt them. Or you might be in a hospital trying to figure out you have readings over time, and maybe you're reading their oxygen level. And for a millisecond, it drops, but then it pops right back up. Right? That was probably a glitch. You don't want to like summon the whole medical staff. right? And so there are multiple cases, a surprising one you may not have thought of is speech recognition, where the thing that happens over time is essentially the acoustic sequence. And what you want to do inference about is the underlying words. So in all of these tasks, there's some underlying state that you don't get to observe. There's some observation that's connected to it. And then these things are chained together over time. So what we're going to do today is we're going to build up machinery for reasoning over time with kind of replicated copies of the world. So in order to do this, we need to introduce essentially um, time slices into our model. 
So what we're going to do is we're going to still have Bayes nets, hidden Markov models, and we're going to talk a little bit later about dynamic Bayes nets. They're still Bayes nets. They just have a very particular regular structure. And for HMMs, um, it means every time slice you get a copy of the network. Now, if we're going to be copying our network, we should start with copying a simple network. So we're going to start with copying a single node. And what you see here is the simplest kind of, uh, of dynamic network. This isn't a hidden Markov model. This is just a Markov model. Okay, it's not been hidden yet. And what a Markov model is, is a chain-structured Bayes net, where you have this variable x that represents something. Right? It could be the weather. It could be uh, whatever you choose to model in the state of the world. And it's replicated time after time after time. Okay, the value at a given time is called the state. Right? This is the thing we're going to try to monitor. It might be the position of the robot, or the weather, or what word's being said in a speech recognition system. And as a Bayes net, you see a chain like this. So in addition to seeing x at every time, you can see an arrow between each time and the previous time. And that's uh, the dependence of the state on the previous state. And what that means is when I give you a network like this, right, it looks like there's a bunch of variables. It looks like here there's four variables. And if I keep drawing it out, there might be 100 variables. But in fact, in a Markov model, they're all the same. There's a kind of stationarity. And what stationarity means, it kind of means the same thing it did when we talked about rewards and MDPs. What it means is it means that at every time slice, the parameters of the model and the dependencies in the model are the same. OK, so here, if I want to specify a Markov model, I have to tell you how it starts. So there's an initial distribution. And so if you look at this, x1 is different than the rest because it doesn't have a parent. So I have to specify a distribution, which could be uniform, or maybe I even know the value at x1. And then at every other time step, I specify a single distribution. Uh, sorry, things are in the way. OK, I can't imagine what. All right, so this distribution, right, this says, how does x at time t depends on, on x at time t, plus, t minus 1? That means how, if I give you a t minus 1 state, this function returns the distribution over what that state will evolve to and with what probabilities. Right. So this tells you how the world changes. And this lives under x2, and it lives under x3, and it lives under x4. So every single clone of this gets the same parameters. Okay, these parameters are called the transition probabilities. They talk about how states transition. They're also sometimes called the dynamics, because this is your model of how the world changes. Right? If, um, if there were a deterministic function, it would live in there. Usually, the world doesn't evolve in a deterministic way, given your knowledge. Okay, This is actually the same thing as a transition model in an MDP. Right? You're in a state, and there's a distribution over s primes you may land in. Here, the states are called x. The difference was, in an MDP, you didn't just have s and s prime. What else was in there in your transition function? Right? There was an a. How the world changed depended on your action. Here, there are no actions. You're just watching. So the result of a state s prime just depends on how the world naturally evolves. You can think about, think about physics. You have, some, uh, you have some apple falling off the tree, and how it evolves depends on uh, its position and its velocity. OK, so um, conditional independence. I drew a Bayes net. That means it comes along with conditional independence assumptions. And here, the conditional independence assumptions are simple, but they're important. And that is, because it's structured like a chain, observing any node along the way will deseparate the two sides of the chain. So if we remember deseparation from earlier. And that means that the past, anything before the current state, and the future, anything beyond the current state, are independent given the current state. So in other words, past and present are, past and future are independent given present. In addition, we say that each time step only depends on the previous one. Now, of course, you could imagine a version of this where there was the dependence went longer, and there are multiple ways to handle that. Okay, and we'll talk about some later. And really, this is just a Bayes net. So in some sense, I could stop lecture. This could be the shortest lecture ever. Because if I give you this chain, you can do variable elimination. You can do Gibbs sampling. You can do anything that you've learned so far. But there are special algorithms that work particularly well, because we know that the structure is this regular repeating thing. OK, so uh, here's an example of a Markov chain. By the way. Most of the time, Markov chains are uninteresting. Typically, they're only interesting once they become hidden Markov models, because then you're associating uh, evidence with something you're trying to infer. So, But here's a specific Markov chain for the weather. So in this abstraction of the weather, which is very, very coarse, there's rain and there's sun. Those are the two states of the weather, weather variable. Let's imagine that on day one, right, when the universe is created or something like that, it's sunny. right? And so I need to supply to you the conditional probabilities that describe how the world evolves. So uh, mathematically, that's the conditional family that of uh, one distribution over the state xt for each previous possibility. 
And so, for example, if the previous one was sun, then it's usually sunny 90%, but 10% of the time it becomes rainy. And if the previous was rainy, then 70% uh, of the time it stays rainy, but 30% of the time it's, it becomes sunny. So in this model, it's a little easier to go from rain to sun than from sun to rain. So sun is, is somehow stickier in this. Right? This is just an example of a Markov chain. What can we do with this Markov chain? Uh, well, we could do things like forecast the weather. Now, um, we used to draw these... Um, we used to draw these, uh, these kind of uh, conditional probability tables like this, where we listed the parent values, and it looked a little bit like a truth table. There are going to be two new ways that we draw these uh, for the purpose of this lecture and next, but they're the same thing. They encode the same 0 0.9, 0 0.1, 0 0.3, and 0 0.7. Uh, they look a little different. Here's one. This one looks a little bit more like a, a, a state machine, right? So now the state is looking a little bit like the state of a state machine. And here it looks kind of like a finite automaton. What you can see here is rain is one state, and sun is another, and the arrows represent transitions that can happen, and the numbers on them represent the probability. So here I can look up, if I want to go from rain to sun, that's 30%. It's the same information as in the table, but now I visualize it as probabilities of moving along a graph. So the states, right, it used to be that nodes were, um, it used to be that if I draw a circle, it's a random variable. It's a node in the Bayes net. These circles aren't nodes in the Bayes net. They are possible values of the variable x. So make sure you're not confused. This one has cycles. This isn't a valid Bayes net at all. It's not trying to be. It's describing how weather kind of transforms in a single time step in our approximation. Okay, everybody happy with this? Okay, here's another way you could draw it. Uh, this way is a little weird, but people often draw it this way to show um, hidden Markov model algorithms. This says, well, if you had some time t minus one and the next time was t, right? This axis here is the time, and going rightward is time advancing. And this vertical axis is the values of the uh, state variable x. So here, the possible values at t minus one are rain and sun, and they're in a column. And the possible values in the next time step are in a column. And now the transitions that it's 30% likely to go from uh, rain to sun is this arrow right here, right? And now it's going between rain and sun, but it's also showing how you go across time steps. So depending on what we're trying to illustrate, we may use any of these three ways of drawing a state diagram. They're all the same. Yes? Conditional probability table. CPT is conditional probability table. One of the many TLAs you must know in this class. Other questions? Yes? <laughs> Does anybody know what TLA stands for? Three-letter acronym. OK which itself is one of the many TLAs you must know for this class. Um, all right, I, I can already tell we're not getting through lecture today. Um, OK, so here's a Markov chain over the weather. Initial distribution is one. I've shown it here as a state transition diagram. Remember, those aren't random variables. They're states. They're values of x. What's the probability distribution after one step? Well, right now it's at t1, it's 100% sun. What about the next step? Well, I can just look at this and read it off. So what's the probability that it will be rain after the next time step? I kind of look at it and I say, well, it's definitely, run net, well, it's definitely sun now, 0.1. OK, now how did I actually do that computation? If I want to know the probability of sun at x2, right, I can look at this and say, well, it's 90% because it was sun before. But really, there's two terms in this, and you just ignored one because it was deterministic at the first time step. If I really want to know the probability that x2 is sun, then what I have to do is I have to write out both possible values of x1, sun and rain, push them both through the transitions, which means multiply the conditional probabilities, and then add them up. OK? I'll derive this in the general case in a bit, but for now, uh, let's leave that a little bit intuitive, um, is that the probability of being at sun is the probability that it went from sun to rain plus the probability that it went from rain to rain. And in order to do that, I need to have a probability over the previous time step, which I just told you. Okay, But this kind of reasoning lets me go from time step to time step. All right, so I can do that computation. So the main algorithm for hidden Markov models is called the forward algorithm. It's an instance of variable elimination, but it's kind of so simple and regular that almost all of the complexity of variable elimination's notation will be gone. Um, and uh, what we're going to do is we're going to think about starting at the current time step and predicting forward one time step after another. So what is the probability of weather on some day? Well, we know it's sunny on the, on the first day, so you can see the robot here is looking at the, at the sun in the real world. And then you predict forward. Well, kind of the next day, it's probably going to be sunny. What's it going to look like in the year 3000? Like, who knows, right? The, what you know about today is really informative for tomorrow, but it's not so informative for the year 3000. 
Okay, so let's figure out how we could how we could mathematically show what intuitively we know to be true here. So let's say we have some known value for uh, the distribution of uh, over x at, a, at time step one. Okay, it's not necessarily deterministic. I have some distribution over x1, and it's known. Well, now what happens when I'd like to know xt? So I, I, I imagine kind of inductively, I have my hands on the distribution over xt minus one, and I'd like to advance it one time step. Okay, so the way that's going to work, I'll just kind of redirive this really quickly over here, is we're going to say the probability of being an xt is going to be the sum over all of xt minus 1, and I introduce p of xt and xt minus 1. Right? This is valid because I just introduced and summed out a variable. Right? And then I can use the chain rule, and I get um, the sum over xt minus 1, my tablet's freaking out here, uh, p of xt given x t minus 1 times p of x t minus 1. Okay, imagine that says x t minus 1. It's, it, it's just this over here. Okay, and so we can just really quickly derive using the laws of probability that if you want to know the total mass on x t, you have to consider every place it could have been at t minus 1 and then multiply by the product of moving to x t and then sum over all of the previous options. Okay. So that kind of reasoning is the core reasoning we're going to do. OK, that's called forward simulation. Um, let's run this. So if I start with an observation of sun, and I push it through that forward simulation, we already know that in the next time step, the distribution is going to be 90% sun, 10% rain. Okay, how about the next day? I don't know. We do some math. Is it going to be closer to 50-50 or closer to 1-0 than uh, x2? Closer to 50-50, right? 84-16. Right? And so I could keep doing this. Is this going to end up somewhere? Is it going to converge to something? Seems, yes. OK, seems reasonable. OK, x4. If you do this forever, it turns out this particular chain converges to 0.75, uh, 0.25. Okay. This is actually a general thing. If you start with uh, an observation of rain, you start with this, and you end up with 0.3, 0.7, because that's what the chain says. And then you, as you kind of move forward, uh, it turns out you, uh, you end up with 0 0.75, 0.25. Does this make sense? Right? The distribution in the year 3000 turns out to not depend on today's value at all. Is that kind of intuitive here? Right? Essentially, whatever you know about today, noise comes in and noise comes in, and eventually, whatever the kind of basic state of the process, your, your, kind of, uh, your, your knowledge doesn't go to uniform, but it goes to whatever the underlying state is. And here, the underlying state of this transition is uh, 0 0.75, 0 0.25. And this is actually true in general. If I start with some probability p and 1 minus p, I'm going to end up at 0 0.75, 0 0.25. So it turns out this, these, uh, this distribution, p x infinity here, 0 0.75, 0 0.25, isn't a function, in this case, of where you start. It's just a property of the transition matrix, okay, of all those x, x given x's. That's okay. actually true in general. How many of you heard of a stationary distribution of a Markov chain? Okay, a couple. So this is true in general. There's some fine print, right? So things break if you've got states that can't ever reach each other. Um, but in, in kind of the general case for well-behaved uh, chains that, that have the right fine print, the influence of the initial distribution gets less and less over time. And so you end up at some distribution, if you predict far enough out, that's independent of where you started. And you can think this is a lot like predicting weather. You can predict weather tomorrow, but not, you know, not well in a month and certainly not well in 10 years. Okay. So the stationary, this distribution you end up with is called the stationary distribution. It's a property of the transition uh, matrix. And it satisfies the system of equations, right? Whatever the probability of some x is at uh, time infinity is what, uh, is what you would get if you took those same probabilities and pushed them through the transitions. And that's just a system of linear equations. You can solve it. Uh, if you've uh, studied a lot of linear algebra, you'll also see that um, this is the principal eigenvector of the transition matrix. OK. so. We have uh, Markov chains. Where you can simulate forward, and very quickly you end up somewhere that doesn't, uh, that's independent of where you started. Um, and so what can you do with them? Well, to a first approximation, you kind of can't do anything with Markov chains. They're not actually that interesting until we hook them up to hidden Markov models. But there are some things. Uh, let me first show you this, uh, this thing I talked about in action. And then we'll see the example of one of the few um, Markov chains that does something all by itself. OK. so. 
let's see. Okay, so this is a, um, does this look familiar? Did Peter show you this for Bayes nuts? Value of information? Okay, so this represents my belief distribution over where some ghost is hiding. You can think of this as kind of a grid world precursor to the invisible ghosts Pac-Man that I showed you at the beginning. So I don't know where the ghosts are. Uh, my only tool for finding the ghost is observing, and so you saw this before, so let's plonk down some observations and see if we can figure out what the ghost is. So it's probably up there. Right, before we talked about things like, am I confident enough? Is the value of information enough that I should sense again, or should I just bust right now? That's not what we're looking at now. What we're looking at now is what happens when I let time advance in my model. So what that'll do is that'll take this distribution, which is my current belief given my current evidence, and it'll put it through the transition dynamics for one step. Right, it'll do that system of summations. And um, where's the 0.7 going to go? How far is it going to go? Is it going to flatten out? That depends on a couple things. It depends on what the transitions are. Right now, the transitions just say that the ghosts usually stay where they are, but with some probability, they move to an adjacent square. So the ghosts are kind of a little bit like Brownian motion. That means when I, uh, that means when I try to advance time, the 0.7 isn't going to move. It's just going to kind of flatten out. So let me advance time. OK, this is tomorrow and tomorrow. And I kind of go out till the year 3000. If I did this long enough, you can see sooner or later, I'm going to be back at a belief distribution that's pretty flat. But even after a bunch of time steps, there's still a little bit of residual information. And all I'm really doing is calculating um, uh, kind of how far the ghost could have gone with what probability. Let me show you another example of what happens when you simulate out. Um, here, is, um, here is a case where the ghosts, the dynamics are the ghost, they're kind of, they're, they're like patrolling. They go around in circles. So let's find the ghost and hope it's, uh, Near an edge. OK, so the ghost is probably here. And when I move uh, time, you're going to see that now my belief is that the kind of this 0.85 is going to move around in a circle, because that's what my, my, my dynamic says. But it's also going to flatten out, because the model says they generally move in a circle, but with some noise. So let's see it. So you can see it's moving around and kind of smearing out until I just have kind of ghost smear everywhere. OK, you can see if I did this long enough, it's plausible that I'd end up with a flat distribution again. But not all stationary distributions are uniform, as we saw with the weather. Um, here is a ghost that um, my model of this ghost is that it uh, goes towards, the, of course, it's in the center. Uh, let's do that again. All right, so the ghost is here. The model is that it usually heads towards the center. Uh, so this ghost is stuck in a whirlpool. So now, as time passes, I'll be less sure exactly where it is, but uh, my belief kind of heads towards the center. And this will not go to a flat distribution. It's kind of wherever it was, it's going to end up there. Everything ends up in the center of the whirlpool. If I had done that from this distribution, right, letting time pass actually increases my certainty. Because I don't know where he is now, but I know in 10 years he's going to be at the center of the whirlpool. OK, so the stationary distribution isn't always uniform. Does anybody know of a really famous example of a stationary distribution that you use every day? Okay. Page rank is a stationary distribution of a Markov chain. So um, what Markov chain? Well, we need a random variable. The random variable is what web page you're looking at. We're going to build a random um, a Markov model. So it's going to be a random uh, process that jumps around from page to page. So you start off with a uniform distribution over kind of some set of pages, maybe all the pages on the web. That wasn't how it was originally done, but that would be fine. Um, and the transitions say that wherever you are, with some probability, you jump to a random initial page again. So you just reset. You close your browser, and you start somewhere random again. But with the remaining probability, 1 minus c, which might be like 0.9, you follow a random outlink from your page. So you click at random from amongst your options. OK, well, what would this do if you actually ran this thing? Well, the, the beginning, you might think you were kind of everywhere. Uh, but as you run this, this is going to converge to a distribution where you have higher probability at any given time at being on a page that's kind of tightly connected. Right? Lots of inlinks means there's a lot of ways to get to you. But you also have to have inlinks that themselves have high, uh, high probability in the stationary distribution. So it's a little bit like counting in degree, but in a, in a way that's a little bit more robust uh, uh, to just having local neighbors that themselves don't mean much. OK, so 
Uh, it turns out you spend more time in this model on highly reachable pages. There's a ton of ways to get to the Adobe Acrobat reader, so it's going to have high page rank. And actually, um, Google 1.0, if you remember kind of back near 2000, um, all Google 1.0 really did was return for you all of the pages that contain the keywords you typed, right? And it put them in an order of decreasing probability under the stationary distribution. That was basically the page rank algorithm. Now, it's changed a lot now, but there were a lot of advantages at the time. For example, one thing people did was they thought maybe the important pages are ones that have lots of links to them. That's reasonable, but then if you wanted to inflate your, your uh, page's search results, you just make a bunch of fake links and link to yourself, and, uh, and that, would, that would fool the system. But it's a lot harder to fool the stationary distribution, because if you make some bogus page to link to you, nothing's linking to it. And if you make pages that link to that, well, nothing's linking to those, and you kind of have to work really hard in order to uh, increase your ranking in this way. This is no longer the dominant thing for search results. Do you know what the big thing that's come along in the past decade or so uh, for search ranking beyond just link analysis and language analysis, of course? Anybody know? It's click streams. So the thing that you can do now is you can watch, of these results, which ones people actually go to and how long they stay there. And by analyzing things like that, you can figure out uh, where the useful information is by watching people's behavior. But that takes, a, that takes more time, and it takes lots of users, right? Whereas something like the link analysis can be done on a brand, uh, a brand new slate. OK, any questions on that? All right, um, here's another stationary distribution that turns out to be very useful. So uh, you talked about Gibbs sampling with Peter. And you can think of Gibbs sampling as um, jumping around in a Markov chain, right, uh, where at each time, you have a configuration of the variables which are not observed, so the hidden variables and the query variables. Okay, So you have x1, x2, which are going to be the same, except for one of the variables will be changed, because that's what you do in Gibbs sampling. You pick a variable and you resample it. It might not actually change, but at most one will change. And it turns out, let's say your transition function says that if you are at a state If you're at a state that says, OK, here's some evidence variables, uh, here's some query variables, here's some hidden variables, and you want to know what, what's the probability of the next state, well, you say with probability 1 over n, we're going to resample variable um, x sub i, or x sub j in this case, uh, according to its conditional distribution. And it turns out that if you do this Gibbs sampling formula, where you pick a variable and resample it according to its conditional distribution conditioned on everybody else in the network, then it turns out that the stationary distribution over these uh, assignments is the actual conditional distribution of uh, those variables given the evidence. So even though you never sample directly from this conditional distribution, you build a chain that over time, um, it spends time in proportion to that probability. And that means if you run the Gibbs sampler long enough, you'll get a sample from the desired distribution. Now, of course, the next step in the chain isn't an independent sample. In fact, it's almost exactly the same sample. You would have to run it a very long time again to be sure you were getting another independent sample. But it's cool here that you can prove that the stationary distribution of this, uh, of this process is the actual conditional distribution you're interested in. OK, that requires a lot of proof. I just told you it was true. I, didn't, I certainly didn't prove it. OK, any questions on stationary distributions before we, uh, we make it hidden? OK. So let's talk about hidden Markov models. So what's a hidden Markov model? A hidden Markov model uh, basically says, all right, with a Markov model, I can talk about how the world changes, but if I just forecast into the future, sooner or later, I just kind of don't know anything anymore. Okay? Um, what a hidden Markov model does is it says, I know two things. I know how the world changes in a time step, which lets me figure out roughly what's going to happen in the absence of evidence. And at every time step, I also get an, uh, some kind of reading. I get some evidence that helps me sharpen my belief about what's happening. So as the same time that time passes, evidence also comes in. The robot moves, and then it takes another sonar reading. OK, so Markov chains, they're not so useful in most cases. You need some observations so that your beliefs can stay sharp. Um, the structure we're going to use is the following Bayes net. OK, the structure we're replicating is just you know, one hidden variable and one observed variable. And what we're going to have is that every time, there's going to be a hidden variable that's structured like a Markov chain. And at each time, the evidence depends only on the state, unobserved, but only on the state at that time. OK, so e given x. Okay, So let's define one, and then I'll show you an example uh, in the demo. So here is the HMM, the weather HMM. Actually, it should be called the sad grad student HMM. This is the example from the uh, Russell and Norvig book. 
the random variables here, the hidden random variable is whether or not it's raining, true or false, which is the same as our sun rain variable. The observed variable, right, uh, and rain evolves kind of in the way that we said it did, right? The observed variable is an umbrella. What does this mean? So in this world, um, you are a sad grad student, um, you are working in your cubicle, you never get to see the light of day because you have a terrible advisor, and the only way you can kind of know about this weather that you've heard so much about um, is that sometimes uh, you see kind of uh, your advisor walk by swinging an umbrella. Okay, and so you think, okay, on those umbrella days, that probably means rain, but not necessarily, right? It's all noisy. Okay, it's kind of a horrible example, um, in, but uh, you know, appropriately gruesome for Halloween. So, um, so, okay, so what do we need to define the HMM? We need one function which says how rain on one day depends on rain on the previous day, right? So this is the rain to sun transition probability. We also need a function that says, given rain, and separately, given sun, what's the probability of seeing the umbrella? Okay, that's called the emission model, right? This tells you how the evidence, uh, what the probability of seeing various evidence values is for each underlying state, okay? So in this case, it says that when it's raining, you see the umbrella 90% of the time, but when it's not raining, you still see it 20% of the time. So from a single observation of an umbrella, you don't know very much. But if day after day you're seeing the umbrella, you start to kind of gain some confidence. So here, uh, here, um, here we have an initial distribution, which isn't shown here, transitions, which show how the, the world evolves in a single time step, and emissions, which show the probability of various evidence values given the underlying state, which we then use to predict the opposite. We then use, we see E and we predict something about, uh, about X. Okay, so let me show you, uh, let me show you this in, um, in the applet. Okay, let's go to these, uh, the, these ghosts that go around in circles. And I'm just gonna observe a bunch so I can figure out where it is. All right, okay. So here, this might my, be my belief at the current time. What, do I, what does it mean when I say belief at a current time? I mean the probability distribution over the current state given all past evidence, okay? Um, so in, in any case, this is what I currently believe the state to be given everything I know. If time elapses, watch this 0.66 will flatten out. These are the ghosts that kind of go around in circles but, uh, but with some random noise. So the 0.6 is, the bulk of it moves according to the dynamics, and the spreading out is also as described by the dynamics. The 0.66 became 0.56. But now if I get to uh, collect an, uh, an observation, like here, suddenly my belief sharpens. Um, and now if I, time passes in general, my belief will flatten, and then uh, my belief here actually didn't sharpen, but I discovered that uh, my distribution was wrong, and so it got better, right? So in general, whenever I inject an observation, uh, my distribution becomes better, and whenever I let time pass, in general, it kind of becomes worse, where I'd have to be careful about what I mean by better and worse and formalize that. Okay. All right. Uh, enough with uh, sad grad students. Um, by the way, that's not really what it's like to be a grad student. Um, so let's talk about the Ghostbusters HMM that I've been showing you, but not really being precise about. Uh, X1 starts uniform. That's where you see 0.02 everywhere on the map. And that's shown here. That's a distribution over the grid. Okay, there's some distribution that says how uh, a position at x depends on x prime. And I have to say, for this square, here's the distribution, right? So it looks like this. For that red square, it's 50% probability of moving one to the right, but there's a 1 6 probability that you'll stand still, and 1 6 probability will go in the other direction. So, where do these conditional probabilities come from? This is your assumptions about the world. You might learn them from data. We'll talk about that uh, much later in the course. But for now, that's just an input. Okay, that's what happens from that one state, but you generally don't know what state you're in, and you need to sum over all of the options. That's what the forward algorithm was about. All right. Um, there's also, a, um, somewhere in there, there has to be specified precisely the probability of a reading at a certain position given the underlying state. So it might say, if you read at 3 comma 3 and the ghost is there, your probability of getting read is 90%. Those facts live in the emission model. They say how the evidence um, directly relates to the state at that time. And we have to kind of uh, uh, integrate that over time um, to be, sh to be uh, incorporating all of our evidence. Okay, that's the Ghostbusters HMM. And HMMs also have uh, conditional independence. So they've got essentially the same ones as the, um, uh, the Markov model, which says in the Xs, the past and the future are independent given the current value. So let's shade in X3. So if, uh, oops, just gave away my quiz, but um, 
Here's x3. If you shade that, x2 and x4 are, are, are now deseparated, right? You can run the deseparation algorithm in your head. Past and present independent given future. And the evidence E3 is independent of everything else given the current state. So there's no dependencies in the evidence. Like, for example, your, your sensor is, noi is, is kind of uh, miscalibrated and is always slightly off to the left or something like that. That would be a, maybe a dependence that you might have to model between the E's. Okay, in an HMM, past and present indif uh, independent, past and future independent given the present, and current observation independent of everything else given the present state. Okay, uh, if you were watching, I already revealed this, but the quiz is, does this mean that the evidence variables themselves are independent? So if I don't observe anything, I could say, is the evidence I see at time one independent of the evidence I see at time two? What do you think? This is like the, the umbrella on Tuesday. Is it independent of the umbrella on Wednesday? So it seems like it shouldn't be, right? It is if I know the underlying state, whether or not in, in that model, whether or not you bring the umbrella as random. Or if you think about the sonar reading that comes out of a robot, it's kind of a random thing. It might or might not see the actual wall, um, but they're only independent readings given uh, the state. If you, um, if you don't know the state, then you're going to see that the evidence is almost always exactly the same as the previous time step, and it's because the state hasn't changed much. And so there's major, uh, major correlation between E1 and 2 that flows through X1 and X2. OK, so the evidence variables are absolutely not independent. They're only conditionally independent given the hidden state. Questions on this so far? OK, so um, I'm going to tell you some examples, and then we're going to um, look a little closer at how you reason in these things. So for every HMM, there is a um, hidden state, which is usually the thing you want to figure out, and an evidence variable, which is the thing you get to observe. You get the evidence at every time, and you usually want to figure out the state at every time. So in speech recognition, the evidence, the observations you get, are the acoustic signals. You can think about it like a waveform, although there's a little more going on. We'll talk about speech recognition next class, actually. So the observations are acoustic signals, one for each time. And the states are positions in words. So if you can figure out the hidden state, you figure out at each time what word I was saying, and you put that together, and that's your recognized text. Uh, machine translation, probably not something you would have thought of as an HMM, but you can phrase that as an HMM, where the observations are the uh, words in one language, and the states are their translations in the other language, and you want to infer one from the other. Okay. There's obviously a whole lot more going on in a translation system. We'll actually talk about machine translation in one of the last lectures. Robot tracking. This is the canonical HMM uh, example. The observations are like range readings, right? And these might be continuous. That's fine. HMMs work in continuous spaces, uh, although in this class, usually everything will be discrete. Uh, the observations are range readings, and the states are positions on a map, which could be continuous, or we might discretize it. Okay. And you see the range readings at every time, and you need to figure out the states. You might be like, OK, there's a wall on my left. OK, now there's a wall on my right. I must be in the middle of Soda Hall, right? Something like that. OK. Um, we talked a little bit about kind of the precursor to the forward algorithm, which is for forward simulation in a Markov chain. Now we're going to talk about how to keep track of what you believe about a variable x, the state variable, as evidence comes in and time passes. And from this, we'll build up the full forward algorithm. OK, so, um, so what's this task? The task is to figure out at any given time, what do I believe is happening in the hidden state, given all the evidence from the first time step all the way up to uh, the current time. Okay. Um, you start with your belief in some initial setting. It's often uniform, like you have no idea where the robot is. But maybe not. Maybe you know that the robot starts out in its charging dock. And then until it starts roaming around in the world, um, that's when you start uh, gaining some uncertainty. As time, up, as time passes, right, we update the belief, maybe to include the, the, some uncertainty of things spreading out. And as observations come in, we also update the belief to include this new evidence we've seen, right, a new range reading or something like that. The, origin, the origins of this actually, um, how many of you have heard of Kalman filters? Okay, Kalman filters are basically the analog of what we're going to talk about today for the continuous uh, case, where your state space is uh, continuous valued, and you make the approximation that kind of everything is Gaussian. So transitions are, are basically um, uh, uh, take a form that's friendly to Gaussians, and the emissions are all uh, Gaussian in shape. We're not going to make any kind of Gaussian assumptions, but we're also not going to work with continuous numbers. 
OK, so here's a picture of this happening and kind of a, a, a robot localization case just to make this a little more concrete. So you imagine you have a robot that looks something like this. So this robot is going down a corridor. It doesn't know where it is. It knows the map. So somebody gave it blueprints. It's going down the corridor, and all it can do is shoot out lasers in each direction and see how uh, close they bounce off a wall. And so it knows there's a wall right here, there's a wall right here, but there is no wall in front of me. And if it gets a reading that says, um, that says there's walls to my left and right, but not in front or behind, then suddenly it shouldn't think it's anywhere in this building. Where should it think it is? It should kind of think it's in a corridor, because corridors look like that. It shouldn't think it's in a corner, because a corner has a different, kind of, uh, a different wall structure. Okay, so the sensor model formally is conditioned on my current position, I need to say a distribution over readings. Okay, let's imagine that instead of the continuous readings, the readings are wall or not in each direction. Okay, so there's a, a reading involves four, kind of four, four bits, whether or not there's a, a wall sensed in each direction. And the model says, given your actual location, which you don't know, but given any kind of hypothesized actual location, the conditional distribution over sensor readings is that there, you might get the actual wall structure, or you might be in kind of one off. One of the ones is a zero, one of the zeros is uh, one, but you never make two mistakes. Okay. There's also going to be a motion model, which is the transition prob uh, probabilities here, that says you're going to be trying to go right, but there's some chance you won't. So um, if I sense that there's a wall above and below, I should have pretty high probability in my belief distribution of being in the dark gray squares. I should have some smaller probability of being in this square, because the, this reading is less likely, the kind of north and south wall reading. It's less likely in that position, but it's not impossible. According to this model, it is impossible that I'm here. Because if I got a north and south wall reading here, I would have had to make four mistakes, and that can't happen in this model. So now this is my distribution. All right, and then time passes, and I uh, project that. And if I get that same reading, the readings are actually shown here in the green on the arrows here. Um, as I continue reading north and south walls, what will happen is I'll, there will be fewer and fewer places which are consistent with my history of readings. And I'll get to some point, for example, right now, that I know I'm in one of these two locations because I know I've been seeing walls uh, north and south um, north and south as I go. And then as soon as I walk into this position, then my belief will collapse because I'll, I'll get a reading that's only consistent with, uh, with this case. Um, let me actually just show you, show you that for real. So people really do that. That's really how robot localization works. Um, let me show you. Uh, We'll do, let's do this one. OK, so what you see here is uh, the dots. We'll, see, we'll talk about what the dots are later, but think about this as your belief distribution. You're, you're going down the hallway. You're seeing that there's kind of a, a wall to your right, OK, now left. And um, as you walk, OK, you could be anywhere. Now you can kind of only be at a place that's kind of near a wall. Now as you see more walls to your uh, side, you, you know you're in this long corridor because you've seen walls for so long. And eventually, your belief collapses down to being in your one of these two symmetric places. You can't tell the difference until you go into a room that would be different uh, based on those two positions. And so one room has a table, the other doesn't. And as soon as you see uh, readings consistent with the table, suddenly your belief collapses to the correct position. Okay, I'll explain why there's dots later. But for now, uh, that's kind of the idea of um, robot localization. OK, let's actually take our break now. So um, we'll take a break here. Then after break, we're going to talk about how to do inference exactly and then how to do inference approximately. Um, and since it is Halloween and this is Pac-Man, I think it would not be complete without some food pellets. So I've brought you food pellets. Um, and if actually, like, I don't know how to do this without causing a stampede, but if uh, some people could come up and grab some things and take them back, that would be great. OK. Let's dig a little bit into the inference machinery. We're going to see two ways to do, uh, we're going to see two ways to inference in hidden Markov models. And what's really interesting, I think, about inference in hidden Markov models is actually the approximate inference will be more intuitive. Even though, in some sense, they're performing the same computation. And usually, approximations uh, can be a little bit harder to reason about. In this case, the approximations can be easier. So bear, uh, kind of bear through the details of the exact case, 
And then when we get to approximate, uh, you may find it becomes more rather than, uh, than less intuitive. So let's do the base cases. There's really two things that happen in HMMs. One is time passes. You go from X at a certain time to X at the next time. The other thing that happens is you see evidence, right? And then these things are interleaved. But if all you had was a single time slice, you had X1, and you saw evidence at, at time one, E1, and you wanted to compute what's the probability over my hidden state X1 given my evidence at time one. So you just want to compute this conditional probability. Well, we know all about Bayes nets. You write down the things you know, and you figure out the things you don't know. So what do I know? This is a Bayes net, so I know some distribution of the marginal distribution P of X1. Right? This is before you see the evidence. Now, I also know a distribution that tells me how the evidence relates to x1. That's not quite what I want. What I want is uh, p of x1 given e, but I know p of e given x1. So even if I had forgotten everything about variable elimination, everything about Bayes nets, I could sort of figure this out just from the laws of probability. right? I want to know p of x1 given e1, and that's not a given. It's, I suddenly have to compute from these things. So I could write out. I could say, well, that's equal to p of x1, and x is capital because it's a vector here. I need, to, uh, I need one of these numbers for each value of uh, x1. e is a lowercase because there's a specific value. Uh, it's a scalar. OK, so p of capital x1 given little e, that's a vector, one for each uh, value of x1, and they add up to 1 if I sum over all the x's. What's that? That's equal to p of x1 and e1 divided by p of e1. How do I know that? That's just the definition of conditional probability. Well, what's that? That's p of um, e1 given x1 times p of x1 divided by p of e1. How do I know that? That is just uh, the chain. That's just the product rule, the simplest version of the chain rule. So this manipulation I just did has nothing to do with HMMs. It has nothing to do with the Bayes net that's there. This is always true. In fact, that's, I just reinvented Bayes rule. Okay, What has something to do with this, with this network is the fact that although I don't know this, I know this. That's a given. And I know this. So the one on the right is more useful. They're both, this is always true. But in this case, uh, it's also useful. Now what I don't know is I don't know the one in the bottom. But that's a constant as I vary x. OK, so as you saw with variable elimination, I can just ignore it. And so the actual reasoning goes something a little bit more compactly. It says, um, I want to know p of x1 given e1. I'm instead going to compute, um, I'm instead going to compute p of x1 and e1 and then normalize in the end. And p of x1 and e1 is just p of x1, which I know, times p of e1 given x1, which I also know. So I compute all of these products current probability times evidence probability. And then once I have that whole vector of those, I renormalize. And now I have the conditional distribution of x1 given e1. So that's what happens when you incorporate evidence. You take your current vector of probabilities over x1. You multiply each one by the appropriate, ev appropriate evidence factor. And then you renormalize. That's it. And that's all it's going to ever be. OK, so that's written out here. The other base case is this. You have a distribution over x1, and rather than seeing evidence, time passes by one step. Well, in this case, I know p of x1, right? That's a known. And I know p of x2 given x1, that's a known. But what I want is p of x2. So how do I do that? Well, I use the laws of probability. Um, and I write, well, p of x2 is p of x2 given x1 times p of x1. Well, let me write this out one more step. P of x2 is the sum over x1 of p of x2 given, sorry, p of x2 and x1, right? I sum out, I introduce a variable and sum it out, which is equal to sum over x1 of p of x2 given x1, which I know, um, and times p of x1, which I also know. So this here, that's the same uh, formula we saw when we just had a Markov chain, right? Because this little snippet here is just a Markov chain. There's nothing hidden. Uh, well, you don't observe them, but there, 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 isn't ev an, there isn't an evidence function here. OK, so if I make that appear in clean LaTeX, what that says is to advance time, you just take your vector of probabilities and you compute a new vector of probabilities by pushing them through the dynamics like this. OK, and those two pieces assemble to do everything you need in HMMs. 
Um, one way to do this is kind of in an online way. Assume you have some vector of probabilities over xt, right? That, that distribution over positions in Ghostbusters, and you have, you have a version that incorporates all evidence to date, and you want time to pass. You take that belief uh, vector, right? So it's a distribution, it sums to one. After one time step passes, what happens? You take your input, which is your current beliefs, you take them and multiply them by the transition probabilities, and then you sum out all the sources, and now you have the probabilities over all of the targets. Okay. This stuff, by the way, very important to sit down and kind of work it through slowly. Right? There's lots of indexes. It's very important whether it's t or t minus 1 or t plus 1. This is good stuff to work through on your own. I'm trying to give you the, uh, the sense of what these equations are doing. OK, so that's how time passes. If you want to write that compactly, you can write it like this, which I find pretty intuitive. It says, you want to know the probability tomorrow of being at some particular xt plus 1? Well, you consider how likely it is to get to that xt plus 1 from each location. So you want to know how likely it is that I'll end up at this particular xt plus 1. You consider all the places that could get you there in one time step. And you say, what's the probability of being here at A and then moving there? What's the probability of being at B, at C, at D, and so on? And that's this. You sum over all the, the places you could have been. You look how likely it is that you were there to begin with times how likely it is had you been there to get to x prime. OK. So um, as I've said a couple times, the basic idea is you take this belief vector and you essentially do a matrix multiply by the, uh, the transition probabilities. OK, we already saw in the applet that as time goes on, if I just do that operation over and over again, uh, things tend to get blurred out. Now, they don't always get blurred out. Sometimes the stationary distribution actually is a lower entropy thing than uh, your current beliefs. But you know, broadly speaking, they tend to flatten out. That's basically your robot knows what's going on today. And sooner or later, if you never get any more evidence, your robot will become more and more confused until it has no idea what's going on. And you can see this yourself. Like, look around. You know where you are. Close your eyes and start walking. OK, for the first couple steps, it'll be OK. And then after about 10 steps, you're going to be worrying that maybe you're not sure where you are, and maybe you're about to bump into a chair. And if you do this for an hour, like, you won't even know if you're in Berkeley anymore. right? So, um, and that's because all these little, uh, little evidence, little, um, without evidence, little tiny uncertainties accumulate. OK, similarly, let's say I have a belief vector that says, here's my probability distribution over what's going on um, at a certain time before I see my evidence. So where did I get this? Well, in the previous time step, I had a belief that included the evidence. So, um, so I had evidence up to t. I projected that forward um, to t plus 1. And so now, given everything I know, I have a belief over what's going to happen tomorrow. Then the evidence tomorrow comes in, okay, and I have to incorporate ET plus 1. So um, then what I do, and this, this one, even though there's this normalization which is confusing, in some sense this one is simpler, it says take your current vector, which represents the various probabilities right now. For each probability, multiply it by the evidence factor. right? So if the evidence is totally inconsistent with that, um, that state, then even if something had high probability, suddenly it might get zeroed out if it can't produce the evidence. So you go to each probability of each state, you multiply each one by the evidence. So the green thing, this is your probability before you saw your evidence. You weight it by the evidence. And then this vector isn't, doesn't add up to 1 anymore, right? Because you had something that added up to 1, and you multiply each, thing, each, each entry by a probability, so you renormalize it. Now it adds up to 1 again. And now it's the conditional probability, including the evidence you just saw. OK, so those are the two basic concepts. When things evolve, you simulate your probabilities through the model. Uh, that's when time passes. And when you see evidence, you take your probabilities, you multiply them by evidence factors, and you renormalize so that they become probabilities again. OK? OK, compactly, that just says you take your vector, you do a pointwise product with the evidence vector, and you renormalize. Now you have your new beliefs. We can talk about, kind of informally, we talk about our beliefs, which is our formally our conditional probability over the state variable given the evidence. Our beliefs are reweighted by the likelihood of the evidence, which should start reminding you of likelihood weighting. You see evidence that's unlikely, then the weight of that thing drops. <clears throat> OK. This is actually important, so I'm, I, I'll, just, I'll say it again, even though I said it once. Um, when time passes, 
you're kind of taking your probability mass, you think about this as a glob of stuff that adds up to one, and you're kind of pushing it around based on the transition dynamics, but none of it goes anywhere, right? You had, one, you had a unit of it before, and then you move it around fractionally, but you still have a unit somewhere. Okay, when you see evidence, it, it, it's like most of it evaporates. Your probability mass mostly goes, and so you have to renormalize. So when you see evidence, you renormalize. When time passes, you don't. And that's gonna be important when we talk about approximation. <clears throat> okay, so. Uh, the example here, um, uh, this is again the Ghostbusters grid schematically. This is what happens when you see an observation. Typically you go from a state of a degree of uncertainty and the observation helps confirm what's going on, right? So you're walking around with your eyes closed and you're wondering, am I gonna hit a chair? Am I in Albany, right? And then you open your eyes and you see, oh, I'm in Soda Hall, right? So when you get the evidence, suddenly instead of having no idea what's going on, your belief function sharpens and then just kind of that's just again that's your old belief function pointwise product by the evidence function and then you renormalize to get your new belief function. Okay. Remember the sad grad student? Right, you start off thinking 50/50 chance it's raining. That means tomorrow 50/50 chance it's raining. So you arrive at work and you think another 50/50 chance, but then the umbrella walks by and suddenly your belief sharpens albeit depressingly to thinking that it's rain out there. And then you arrive the next day. Well, you think it was probably raining yesterday, so today it drops uh, towards 50-50, but it doesn't go there, and then you see another umbrella, and it spikes up again. So here you can see there's just a small number of numbers and a simple example how um, time passing tends to lose information, but observing evidence tends to gain it. Okay, this slide. It's important, and I'm not gonna walk through all the details, because this is something that is absolutely better for you to kind of derive out yourself. I'm gonna sketch it, and then you should all go and make sure you understand these derivations. There are way too many subscripts for me to do this now without everybody glazing over. Okay, but here's the basic idea. The forward algorithm is a dynamic program for computing at each time slice the distribution over the state at that time given all the evidence to date. So schematically on an HMM, you have, your hidden, you have your, uh, your hidden X's at all times, you have your evidence at all times, and what this algorithm does is it says, okay, I'm assuming that you've observed everything up till now, and your query variable is this variable right here. I would like to know the current state X, given the current and previous evidence, and all of the previous time states, they need to be marginalized out. I don't care about them. Sum them out. So how do you do it? Well, what you want is you want a vector of values over x, okay? And as in all variable elimination algorithms, instead of actually directly computing the conditional probabilities over this um, vector of x, we're gonna compute the joint probabilities and then normalize at the end. So what I want is I want for each value of x, I want the joint probability of xt, right, for every possible xt, and the fixed value of the evidence I've seen to date, right? So what do I do? I'm gonna expand that out. So I'm gonna introduce the previous time step. Then I'm going to factor everything according to the hidden Markov model, which says that um, something happens previously, there's a transition probability, and then there's an evidence probability. So this line is only allowed because of the independence assumptions in the HMM. And then I rearrange and rewrite. And what I end up with is that if I want to compute the joint distributions over xt um, and the evidence from 1 to t, it kind of recurses down to the same quantity at the previous time. Okay. Because of this recurrence, we actually compute it the other direction. We start with xt and, sorry, we start with p of x0 given um, to the joint version. We start with p of x0 and e0, which are basically easy to get. And then from that, we run it through this update to get p of x1 and e0, e1. And then we run it through that update again, and then we get p of x2 and e0, e1, e2, and so on. And so this update keeps taking you from one time step to the next, and it does it by this part here, which is the passage of time, Right where you um, where you do that matrix multiply basically, and this time this uh, this part here, which is the pointwise product with your evidence, 
So if you kind of look at this on your own, you'll see the two pieces we've been talking about in this equation. Yes? Oh, good question. Thank you. Actually, uh, big thank you for asking that. Uh, it's an important thing, and I didn't describe it. This is the proportional sign. That means the thing on the left and the thing on the right differ by some constant factor. Okay, we've seen that before. When I write this subscript x, what that means is that the nature of that proportionality is that if I compute the thing on the right for each value of x and normalize, I'll get the things on the left. This is a very, very useful concept. This is that last step of variable elimination, where you take your joint probabilities, normalize them over the query variables, and they become conditional probabilities uh, uh, of query given evidence. That's exactly what's happening here. Thanks. Other questions? OK. This is variable elimination. So if you totally blank on this, this is variable elimination, where you eliminate the variables in increasing order. Okay. Um, let's talk about uh, so, something different. Um, let's say you look at that and you say, all right, I get that there's these, there's variable elimination. I can compute big tables of, um, I can compute big tables of probability distributions over X and I can do these online, I can do these step-by-step uh, -step updates. But there's actually a couple problems. Okay, one problem which really will go away with just looking at the equations is, there's enough sums and products that it can kind of become a little unclear what the equation's doing until you're familiar with it. That's a temporary problem. But there are permanent problems as well with the exact inference. One is, sometimes the space x is really, really big, and there's almost no chance that you're anywhere except a couple locations. So think about if you discretized campus down to one centimeter by one centimeter squares, and you have a robot that's right here, and you start it here and you run it for a minute, well, you kind of don't know if it's going to be three feet or seven feet in that direction, right? But you know that it's not going to kind of be in Sproul Plaza, right? And so you have this giant state space. You're only using a small little piece of it. Um, and so somehow we'd like to not have to have our co computation be proportional to um, the number of states. And in fact, it's proportional to the square of the number of states. Because if you look at the algorithm for each state, you sum over each preceding state. Um, secondly, there are. Uh, more complicated versions of HMMs called dynamic Bayes nets, which we'll talk very briefly about today, for which inference actually gets quite difficult. You'll see some examples of these on your P4. So what are we going to do? Well, here's what we're going to do. We're going to replace the idea of a probability distribution that for each possible value of x returns you a number. It's a lookup table. For every state, you get a number. Instead, we're going to keep around a collection of hypotheses that may or may not be correct. And the hypotheses are going to embody a distribution as samples. So it's going to look something like this. You've got a map. And instead of each square centimeter of that map having a tiny probability attached to it, I'm just going to have 300 places I might be. Now, if I looked at these samples, I don't exactly know where I am. Each sample says something different. But I would guess that I'm somewhere in the upper right. And that's the idea. OK. So filtering uh, for filtering, particle uh, filtering is the approximate solution. Partially, this is because x can be too big to use exact inference. right? For example, x may even be continuous. And partially, it's because this will extend nicely to more complex generalizations of HMMs. So um, instead of keeping track of uh, a map from x to real numbers, I'm going to keep track of a list of samples. Here there are 10 samples. Each red dot is a sample. And in this case, my samples live on some but not all of the locations on the grid. OK, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to track samples, not all the values. The samples will be called particles, but they're just hypotheses. right? They're something that might or might not be true. And the more of them there are, the more you think it might be true. OK, so um, let's, say, uh, uh, let's say that my representation of the distribution over the state x is now a list of n particles. So for example, here, instead of writing nine numbers, right, which is one probability for each square, I'm going to have maybe 10 particles. So here there's 10 particles here. Um, each particle has a specific value of x. Right? So the green particle would be 3, 3, and it's shown in the list here. 
it's not the only particle that represents that hypothesis. We've actually got five completely different particles that are all predicting the same state. If I looked at these particles and I said, what's the probability of 3 comma 3? What would I say? I'd say 50%, because half my particles are there. If I looked at these particles and I say, what's the probability of uh, 2, 2? According to these particles, the answer is 0. That's probably wrong, but um, that's what the particles say. So these particles are samples, so for now they all have uh, weight 1, and there are going to be many values of x that have the value 0, because there are no particles there. And that's the whole point. The number of particles, even though it's not on this uh, example, the number of particles should be much fewer than the number of states in the world. All right, so instead of keeping track of a map, of a map from states uh, to probabilities, I keep track of a list of states x called particles. Now. Um, what do I do, right? I might start with my particles uniform, or I have some particular belief. And when time passes, I need to move these particles around to reflect that. So I pick up each particle, right? So I pick up this green particle, and I say, OK, you are a hypothesis of 3, 3. Where will you be next time in the next time slice? Well, I have to grab my transition model, which might say you know, counterclockwise motion with high probability. So I grab this particle, and I say, you're no longer a distribution. You're a single value of x, right? You may be wrong, but you're a single value of x. And for that particular value of x, I have, um, I have a transition function that says, from that specific square, here's where I go and with what probability. Now there's this one particle, and it can't do all of the things that might happen. So I flip a coin. This is sampling. I take this particle, and I pick one of the things it might evolve into and I pick in proportion to the conditional probability given by the transition function. And so I get a new sample, which might be in the same place, or it might go counterclockwise. And if I do that to each one of these 10 particles, I might get these 10 particles out. Okay, so there's like a conservation of particles. Each particle was somewhere and out somewhere else, or it might have stayed in the same place. I don't create particles, I don't destroy particles. I pick them up one by one, and I simulate what might happen to that particle in the next time step. So there might be five particles on 3, 3, but they might not all get the same future, because I flip a coin for each one. So they might spread out, and in this case, they do. Does that make sense? So someone gives me an HMM, that means they've given me the transition probabilities, I take my particles, and each particle gets simulated. That's like letting time pass in my model. So that's how, in particle filtering, time passes. What happens when I get evidence? It's a little trickier, right? So when I get evidence, so let's say um, here are my particles, so here are my 10 particles. What happens when I get evidence that there's a reading of red, meaning the ghost is close, right here in this, uh, in this square 3, 2? Well, remember how evidence works in the exact case. I take each of my, uh, each of my probabilities and I downweight it by the probability of the evidence. So the analog of that here is to take each of your particles and give it a weight that reflects how likely the evidence is from that location. So this green particle that's at 3, 2, maybe the probability of seeing red, if you actually are at 3, 2, is 0.9. So this is a reasonable hypothesis. But this guy here has a very low probability of seeing uh, this reading. right? So if you were, maybe the red reading's possible, but it's very unlikely. And so this guy gets a weight of 0.1. This should remind you of something. This is like likelihood weighting. So when time passed, I just picked a future, just like regular sampling. But here, I have to, I'm stuck with the observation I have. So instead of generating it, I force each sample to accept this future, and some of them accept it with a high probability, and some of them accept it with a low probability, and are now these tiny little samples that have small weight. Okay. There's one more trick, which is if I did this, my samples would kind of go all over the place. And rather than clustering in the high probability regions, they just kind of drift around. And some of them would get big weights, and some of them would get small weights. So what I'd like to do is I'd like to, as samples become very small, I'd like to kind of naturally and correctly have samples move over to where they're needed. And the way that works is even though, um, strictly speaking, multiplying the, each sample by the evidence weight is enough to um, is enough to incorporate the evidence. I want to get back to unweighted samples that are where kind of the where samples all have the same weight and tend to cluster in high probability regions. So what you do is there's what's called a resampling step. So in resampling, we we say I'm not going to track these samples and their weights. So I line up my weighted samples 
and I say, all right, guys, there's 10 of you. Um, we're going to get 10 new sa samples. Right, so you're all fired. Um, we're going to get 10 new ones according to your distribution. Okay, so we're going to get 10 new particles. And for each new particle, we're going to pick one of the old ones in proportion to their weights. That means 3, 2 had a pretty high weight. And so even though we get rid of all the old particles, there are going to be a lot of new ones which choose 3, 2. And so you go from a position like this, where part of the information of the distribution is in the location of the hypotheses, the particles, and part of it is in their weights, you now have a new sampling where all of the information is in their location. They are now all equally weighted. Where did the weights go? They went into the multiplicities. So the fact that 3, 2 had a high weight leads to more particles that get cloned from it. And the fact that 1, uh, whatever this was, uh, uh, the fact that 1, 3 had a low weight, that's reflected in the fact that probably it's not going to get chosen for the new team. Okay, This is kind of like renormalization. But procedurally, the idea is when you see evidence in your particle filter, you line up your particles, you weight them by the evidence, and then you clone new particles from your own, own par old particles, and now the weights are all gone. Any questions about that? Then I'm, I'm going to show you this in action. OK, so here's a schematic, and then I'll show it in the demo. You have some belief function. Who knows where you got it? Maybe it's your initial function. It's represented by a list of particles of things that might be true. And they're all kind of, the, the particles represent your distribution um, as samples. When time passes, you take your particles, and you don't, you don't add or delete particles. For each one, you pick a future for it through simulation. You flip a coin, right? Um, that's like prior sampling. Then, when evidence comes in, you weight the particles based on a factor from the evidence. So some particles get shrunk down to almost zero. Other particles that match the evidence still have a pretty uh, substantial weight. Then you decide you don't actually want these weighted particles. So you resample n new particles, and each one clones an old particle. And that means some old particles now uh, kind of have multiplicity, and some of them are gone. And that's it. You, kind of, uh, you recycle that over and over again. So let me show you what that looks like in the applet. And uh, we'll talk about DBNs next time. But I'm, gonna show you, I'm just going to show you some demos now. OK, so here is what you get when you do particle filtering with some particles. This is the dynamics where the ghosts go around in circles. There's my uniform initialization. Particles sprayed everywhere. This should be uniform. The right answer is uniform. Is it uniform? It's kind of uniform. But you know, there's not that many particles. So some places didn't get a particle, and some places got four. Right? You know, life's rough when you sample. Um, now, if I sample, the particles will all collapse down. Sorry, if I take observations, the particles collapse. And as time passes, it kind of does the right thing. But when I see this 0.28, that's not an entry of 0.28 for that cell. That's that there's 28 particles sitting there or something like that. right? And every time I elapse, some of the particles peel off and kind of float to the side. And that's why that 28 becomes 16 over time. I'm going to show you two other extremes of this. Here's one extreme. Uh, here's one particle. Oop, there it is. That's my uniform initialization. I mean, when you only got one particle, it can only be so uniform, right? So this particle, where is it? Where does he go? Well, he goes somewhere, right? I'm simulating this guy, and sometimes he goes the wrong. He, sometimes he goes a low probability way, right? This is very, very uninteresting with one particle. It's really easy to do, but you're not getting really good results, right? I could very easily, uh, I mean, like it doesn't really matter what I read. That's my particle, and I'm stuck with him. Okay, I don't know what happened there. Um, so uh, here's another extreme. This is particle filtering with just tons of particles. It looks like the right answer. It's not, right? There's some point ones. There's a point one right here. But it's pretty close. And with enough particles, this is slow because everything I do has to be kind of the time, the compute time is proportional to the number of particles. But you can see it's kind of behaving pretty robustly. So you might need a lot of particles. And the trick is making Sure, you're in a domain where the number of particles you need is much smaller than the number of squares. This is not a good domain for particle filtering. OK, let me show you a couple other things. Um, I'm going to show you this demo again. This is robot localization with particle filtering. Each red dot is a particle. Each one is a hypothesis. Every time you get a sensor reading, you say, is this particle consistent with what the lasers have told me where the walls are? And if the answer is no, the particles basically die. 
And so when you do the resampling step, the particles tend to cluster to where you are. This is like when you walk out of the elevator in Soda Hall and you can't tell where you are until you walk around and see a water fountain, right? You're like, you could be in two places, you see the water fountain, and now you're only in one place. Okay. Um, I'm going to show you, okay, we don't really have time, so I'm just going to show you one more thing. And I'll show you something cool next time. All right, remember we talked about the Pac-Man sonar where the ghosts were invisible? This is what your project fours will be once you plug in your HMM inference. Um, you will now see belief distributions that represent Pac-Man's uh, posterior belief given all of the range finding to date. And now you still don't see the ghosts, but you can kind of see clouds of where you think they might be, which is still apparently hard. See how it kind of collapses when he gets into the corridor because a lot of the noisy things that might be true uh, aren't true and so on. All right, so that's project four. Uh, it should be up by the weekend. And uh, everybody have a good Halloween. If there's anybody who didn't get any candy, you can come up, we have some more up front. <laughs>